ever since I first watched it. The Russell T Davies era of Doctor Who has consistently been one of my favourite TV shows, and at each stage of my life, that's been for a different reason. As a child, I loved the fantasy of it. The aliens, the danger, the costumes, the excitement. As an adolescent writer, I started to really get the underlying emotional aspects of the characters and the relationships, and understood that that was the real heart of the show. And as a young adult now, I've begun to appreciate a deeper, darker level to this period of the show's storytelling and world building, and that's the relevant, occasionally intense socio-political allegories that run through a lot of its episodes. Political commentary and real-world social illusions had long been a feature of Doctor Who's run in the 20th century, and come 2005, the new era was no different. The first Davies era included stories relating to racial conflict, slavery, ostracization through fear, genetic experimentation, religion versus atheism, internment of enemy nation citizens in wartime, and domestic abuse to name a few. The 2005 series' first real stab at these elements were in the Ninth Doctor's first two-parter, Aliens of London and World War III, the Slovene episodes. Like a lot of pop culture from the early 2000s, it was impossible for Doctor Who to avoid the lingering spectre of 9-11. At the time, and throughout most of the 21st century so far, much has been said about the quality of relevant political leaders' justifications for entering into conflict in the Iraq War, and how much of what these leaders said was the absolute truth. Davies wrote a story intended to scratch at that very same topic, how the truth can be bent by those in power to devastating consequences. The ultimate story of these episodes is that the Slovene, an interstellar alien crime family, murder and disguise themselves as influential members of the British cabinet before staging an alien crash landing hoax, intending to drum up alien hysteria amongst the public to justify their own procurement of nuclear weapon release codes, to strike back against an alien threat that doesn't really exist, in a plan somewhat reminiscent of Alan Moore's Watchmen, except instead of uniting the world against this invented threat to achieve world peace, with the nuclear codes, the Slovene intend to reduce the Earth to rubble. We reduce the Earth to molten slag, then sell it. Radioactive chunks, capable of powering every cut price starliner and budget cargo ship. There's a recession out there, Doctor. These episodes hit on a series of political points that related so well to observable politics at the time of broadcast. Faith in government across the Western world was shaken and Davies wrenched that conversation wide open by demonstrating how politicians occasionally stood to gain by exaggerating or even contriving threats. And it's here that the 2005 series of Doctor Who demonstrated that it really was ahead of its time. The Slovene, in part, relied on mass public opinion, and in particular, public anxiety, to pressure the people in charge of the nuclear codes to release them. And in order to do that, they had to invent these fake stories. In the here and now, the topic of fake news is a widespread subject of discussion. Far too many falsified or misunderstood stories have made headlines for the situation to continue without a concrete name. And fake news, as a term, has sprung into capital letter existence. But at the time of these episodes being broadcast, the concept wasn't so widely understood. The capacity of the news to spin stories and events to shape public consciousness as politicians or media desired has existed for far too long to chart. But it's only in the last few years that the true scale and effect of the problem has risen to widespread attention. But upon returning to the 2005 episode The Long Game, also written by Russell T Davies, it's clear to see that warnings about fake news existed long before the term became a household name. The Long Game centres on Satellite 5, a space station that's become the singular hub of news media for the entire planet Earth, wherein a technology exists for people to have their brains directly interface with a compressed version of all the news and information from the planet below, with the Doctor remarking that whoever controlled this system would be incredibly powerful. What's going on? It's not just this space station, it's the whole attitude, it's the way people think. The great and bountiful human empire is stunted, something's holding it back. And with the eventual reveal that the villainous editor and his editor-in-chief, the mighty Jagrafes, had been shaping the news the Earth received in order to bend the human race to their own will, we can see the power of fake news on a grand scale. Create a climate of fear, and it's easy to keep the borders closed. It's just a matter of emphasis. The right word in the right broadcast repeated often enough can destabilise an economy, invent an enemy, change a vote. In 2005, it would have been hard to predict the degree to which our own personalised, endless news and entertainment media streams would dominate our view of the world around us. And this episode seems to have perfectly predicted the future on that front. 
and the concept's inclusion as something to be wary of has stood the test of time, as the potential for fake news to dilute and distort people's individual views on the world only increases when it's all coming from one place. The story purpose behind this global media distortion is that, as part of their screaming return to the universe as an interstellar threat, the Daleks have slowly, imperceptibly warped society in a degenerate fashion, the result of which is the Bad Wolf Corporation's murderous recreations of reality TV shows The Weakest Link, Big Brother, and What Not To Wear. They use the media to close our hearts and make us not care when our fellow people are killed. And if you think that's something that could only exist in the realm of sci-fi, we disagree. In the final episode of Series 4, Journey's End, Davros drops a lot of smashing villain dialogue, among which is this. The man who keeps running, never looking back because he dare not out of shame. This is my final victory, Doctor. I have shown you yourself. Davros has illustrated to the Tenth Doctor just how many people have become soldiers, fought and died all because of him. He doesn't have to accuse the Doctor of something he didn't do to drag him down. All he has to do is show the Doctor a mirror, and the insult is complete. And the same is true of Bad Wolf as an episode, because it shows the human race that same mirror, and the consequences of its own selectively bred apathy. Without going into specifics, the British public is no stranger to what can become a participants of reality TV shows, such as the ones warped by Davies and Bad Wolf. The filter and the emotional distance provided by the screen between the events and the viewers can leave us short on empathy. Stay with me, I promise I'll get you out alive. Come on! No, I can't, I can't. Linda, you're sweet. From what I've seen of your world, do you think anybody votes for sweet? And if Doctor Who's previous foresight is anything to go by, we ought to be afraid of where these trends end up unchecked. But just as the Doctor travels through the future and the past, the series has made effort to not only predict where society is heading, but also to reference significant historical events with its own sci-fi twist. The Christmas Invasion was a big, bold episode of Doctor Who, the first to release after the runaway success of the revived 2005 series. And while it was keen to lay the foundation for the future of the show with David Tennant as the Doctor, the episode drew from the past in order to tell that story. The Doctor, as usual, manages to save the Earth by defeating the Sycorax leader in combat, then commanding the mothership to leave Earth. And as it's Christmas, they agree. It seems like yet another happy ending, until Prime Minister Harriet Jones invokes Torchwood to blast the retreating Sycorax ship out of the sky in an act that feels more like a war crime than reasonable self-defence. Harriet states that this was necessary, that she was worried the Sycorax would spread word of Earth across the galaxy. You said yourself, Doctor. They'd go back to the stars and tell others about the Earth. I'm sorry, Doctor, but you're not here all the time. You come and go. And to be fair, she has a point. She watched as the Sycorax murdered her colleagues right in front of her, and was under no obligation to do them any favours. It is a genuine moral dilemma, nowhere near as simple as the Doctor makes it out to be. And the real-world inspiration behind this event is similarly complex. On the 2nd of April 1982, the British-owned Falkland Islands off the coast of Argentina were invaded by the Argentine junta led by Leopoldo Galtieri. I'm not going to get into the whys, and I'm not going to point fingers, but to this day, there remains a conversation not only about the true ownership of the islands, but also around the ethics of the behaviours of both governments involved, most notably, the sinking of the General Belgrano, an Argentine Navy cruiser by British forces. And if you're wondering why I'm mentioning this, let's see if this sounds familiar. Following initial open conflict between the two nations, Britain set up an exclusion zone with a radius close to 400 kilometers around the Falkland Islands, meaning that any Argentinian ships that entered this exclusion zone would be destroyed. After detecting maneuvers by the Belgrano outside of this exclusion zone, where it believed itself to be safe from attack, British intelligence suddenly decided to expand the exclusion zone to include the area in which the Belgrano was operating then to strike the Belgrano in a surprise attack that killed over 300 people. The full story is a little bit more complicated than that, but the attack on the Belgrano became a big media story in Britain, with Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, who had personally agreed that the attack should go ahead, being criticised for committing a war crime, partly due to claims that the ship had actually been heading away from the exclusion zone at the time that it was attacked. So it should be clear by now where Davies took his inspiration from, in turning Harriet Jones into Doctor Who's own Thatcher analogue. 
The doctors carefully placed six words to undermine her authority, and the resulting rumours that became headline news even mirror health rumours that dogged Thatcher towards the end of her political reign. It remains impressive just how much respect this era of the show gave to its audience, tackling such complicated and deadly incidents, and in stories that still manage to be fit for all ages. The most extreme example of this has to be the backstory of Series 3's episode Gridlock. It's a standout episode from the series, and it follows the tiered storytelling format I mentioned in the beginning. There's a present, physical, primary threat in the form of the Macra, the giant man-eating crabs that live in the belly of the motorway. There's a deeper emotional story relating to the Doctor and Martha's burgeoning relationship, and how the new New York residents keep their faith in dark times. And there's a social allegory framing the entire narrative that relates to a tragedy in recent memory. The reason the new New York government collapses in the episode is due to the proliferation of drugs or moods as the episode calls them, and more specifically, a new mood called bliss that turned out to be highly addictive. Now when I first watched this episode, I misunderstood this element of the story and thought that the Senate had simply been so addicted to bliss that they'd let literally every other aspect of their lives fall apart, which would be a dark enough idea on its own. It was only years later on a rewatch that I picked up on this line. They couldn't stop. A virus mutated inside the compound and became airborne. Everything perished, even the virus in the end. It wasn't the drug itself that killed people, it was a disease that transmitted through the drug that ended up fatal. And this might be the darkest concept explored in this era of the show. Russell T Davies was a young man in the 1980s, and drew from his lived experience in the decades gay community to write the incredibly moving series It's a Sin, which explores the toll that the sudden spread of HIV and AIDS had on that community, both in the lives it took and on a broader cultural level, with the gay community being not only falsely blamed for the spread of the virus, but treated by many as responsible for its very existence, with the accusation of them being somehow backwards and dirty, and the very issue being shamed into silence. And for as incisive as It's a Sin is, there are certain elements it focuses on over others. The show primarily discusses the spread of HIV and AIDS through sexual contact as opposed to other means, such as the sharing of needles in drug circles. Having a certain focus on one element of the subject doesn't necessarily mean this is an oversight by Davies. It's entirely possible he felt like including this aspect of the crisis in It's a Sin would be retreading old ground, as this element of the spread of HIV and AIDS is clearly sewn into the story of Gridlock. It's impossible to appreciate this aspect of the episode when you're watching it as a child, maybe even as a teenager. But the episode shines, as many do, on an adult rewatch, when we're able to fully appreciate not just the level of respect these writers had for us as an audience in sanitising, though not downplaying the importance of these issues, but also the immense skill of creating such layered stories that keep on giving the more you watch them. These socio-political elements, for me, contribute to a kind of subtle metric running through this era of the show. I see most of the Davies era episodes as falling on either side of a scale. At one end, stories that represent redemption, social progress, and optimism about the human race's place and future in the universe. On the other end, dismay, tragedy, social decay, and pessimism, near fatalism, about our society's capacity to grow and integrate into the universe. To put it simply, each episode makes me wonder, was it better or worse that the events in this story happened in the first place? It's usually hard to give a simple answer to this, because episodes like The Doctor's Daughter are bittersweet, with a hopeful ending only coming after a whole lot of bloodshed. The Empty Child and The Doctor Dances have a resoundingly positive outcome, despite a whole lot of tragic stuff happening. In the end, literally everything is resolved, and arguably better than it had been before. But episodes like Midnight counteract that, showing us at our worst that thousands of years into the future, on a beautiful planet that exhibits the boundless majesty of the universe, people are still people. Is the universe beautiful? Or is it terrifying? Can we as a species ever reach anything approaching a utopia? Is the future something worth being optimistic about? Can it be, if only we address the issues of the here and now? These are the questions that Doctor Who consistently brings to the table, 
It's an undeniable fact that the show remains a British institution that has grown alongside our society. And a big part of the reason it's remained relevant are these allusions to the real world we live in. With an explosive new series on the horizon, Doctor Who's on the verge of potentially being bigger than it ever has been, with a high chance of eclipsing even the peak of its international success in the early 2010s. I only hope, and to be honest, expect, that these socio-political elements make a return. Because for me, they're what turn this goofy, soulful, sci-fi adventure into something really special.